you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands and your voices today? Thank you for your anointing, Lord, that breaks every chain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord. It's your anointing, Lord, that breaks the chains, that breaks the yoke of sin. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of you in this building today can raise your hand and say that God has broke chains off of your life? You stand here today as a testimony to a God that can deliver. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I turn your attention today to the book of Exodus chapter 15 and verse 19. The power of the Holy Ghost is here in such a mighty way today. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 19. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of of the sea. Our subject this morning for the next few moments is simply the residue of the miraculous. The residue of the miraculous. God bless you and you may be seated. My four-year-old daughter sat in my office on Monday night, waited for me to finish up my work so that I could read to her. While she waited, she took out her play flip phone and began to talk on it. She said, yeah, okay, no, that's fine, I understand, no, I'll be okay, don't worry about it, take care of yourself. And then she snapped her phone shut and looked at me. This imaginary conversation had captured my attention she looked at me and I was looking at her and she arched her eyebrows and said that was my ex-boyfriend <laughs> I had no idea that girls practice a breakup call at four years old. It reminded me about human nature. In our humanity, we are preconditioned for failure. We are preparing for failure even before we have failed. We so fear failure that we try to prepare ourselves for failure, and the children of Israel were not exempt from this demonstration of human nature. Children of Israel were so fearful of failure, they were off the radar with their fear of the Egyptians. 400 years of tyranny had done more than break their backs. It had broken their spirits, not one generation, not one century, but many generations and many centuries and many years. Anyone that had attempted to rise up and to break the chains of slavery were beaten back down and made an example. So effective were the Egyptians with their maniacal whips and torture techniques that the children of Israel became prisoners of their own thoughts. Though their bodies had begun to march out of Egypt and toward their destiny, their minds and emotions were still held captive. The definition of the word residue is something that remains after a part is taken, separated, or designated or after the completion of a process. That part that remains is referred to as the residue. When these children of Israel saw the dust of the approaching chariots behind them and the large Red Sea body of water in front of them, they turned on Moses and they said these words, 
Were there no graves in Egypt? But you have brought us into the desert to die. We tried to tell you, Moses, to leave us alone. Were we not better off as slaves in Egypt than to die in the wilderness? They spoke in the residue of tyranny. Though they were out of Egypt, something remained. Something unseen was now rearing its ugly head. Their statement revealed their fear. Even though it was uttered on the heels of no less than ten miracles that the Lord had performed in recent days, delivering them out of Egypt, yet there was a residue of slavery that hung over their heads. Moses lifts his voice like a trumpet and shouts out, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Then the Bible says that the cloud that was leading them then went behind them and became a wall between them and the approaching Egyptian army. It cast darkness on the Egyptian soldiers, but it brought light to the side that the children of Israel were on. This is the Bible making it clear that God has your back. He was the first one to have your back before having your back was a popular saying. He literally moved the cloud to their back and created darkness to come upon the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, friends may run when things get tough. Family members may bail on you when trouble comes, but God has your back. Thank you for that, Lord. Moses extends his hand now out over the Red Sea, and the Bible says that the wind began to blow from the east. All night long it blew, and the waters stacked up on either side like tall buildings, revealing a path for the children of Israel to walk through the sea. No less than three times it says something that cannot be ignored. Two little words, dry ground. Verse 16, but lift thou up the rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Verse 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. Verse 22, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Finally, finally, after reading this for the fourth time in our text, it dawned on me. There was a miracle in the midst of the miracle. The miracle of the sea rolling back captures our attention. The miracle of chariot wheels coming off and the destruction of 600 elite Egyptian soldiers drowning with their horses in the sea eclipses those two little words that I want to shine the light on today. Dry ground. It reveals something very significant about our God. Couched in the context of Moses' words to them on the brink of this miracle. The Egyptians that you see today, you shall see them again no more forever. And it becomes clear that God was bringing a finality to this matter. He was bringing things to a close. It was going to take land. Land that had sat under the sea for thousands of years and make it dry. Dry ground. The land that they walked on as they walked through the midst of the Red Sea was not even damp. It wasn't even soggy. It wasn't even mud on their shoes. Dry ground. Just as dry as the dusty desert that they had traversed traveling out of Egypt. What does that mean to you and I? When God shows His power, he is not held captive to prior conditions. Oh, hallelujah. He does not have to work with what nature has left him. He is not limited by the past. He can change the environment from the ground up. Yeah. 
so that when God is done, there's not even any evidence of a prior problem. Dry ground. What sea? What obstacle? What hindrance? Where is the evidence of a pre-existing problem? Before there was Obamacare, there was Jesus care. And Jesus never exempted anybody because of a pre-existing condition. Because my God can take whatever you got and he can change it from the floor up. You've not gone so far that God can't break every chain. You've not gone so far that God can't build a new foundation under your very steps. Now, I don't know about you, but I take comfort in this. Because when I come to God, He's not limited by the consequences of my past. He's not held hostage by the sins of my past. He gives me a new foundation. I don't have to walk in the natural residue of wrong choices. Let me just let that sink in for a moment. You and I don't have to walk in the residue of natural consequences to the wrong choices we've made. I don't have to live with the results of wrong decisions that I made in my past and that you made in your past. I've got a God that leaves a residue of the miraculous. And that residue is simply this. What past? What sin? What problem? What fear? What insecurities? I got a brand new foundation. He not only forgives me of my sin, he not only delivers me from my sin, he removes the stigma of sin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not just your behavior that changes when you come to God. It's your thinking that changes. I am a child of God. I've been bought by his blood. I've been sanctified by his spirit. I can do all things through Christ. It strengtheneth me. He removes all the evidence that there was ever even an opponent. I want you got to get this. He removes any evidence that there was ever even an opponent. That there was ever even a challenge. Before this, Moses was in the desert and God had called him through this burning bush. Told him to take off his shoes. He was on holy ground. Moses did that. and He had a staff in his hand because he was a shepherd out in the desert. He'd been in exile from Egypt for 40 years. And God says, throw your staff down. He throws it down. It comes a snake. Then he said, reach down and pick it up. Picks it up and it comes a staff again. Wow, that's kind of cool. I'm going to remember that. That what you got for me? I want you to go into Pharaoh's court and tell him to let my people go. Well, that sounds like a suicide mission. And so Moses starts to say, well, I'm not very good at talking and, and this and that. And he says, well, well, we'll send your brother Aaron with you. He's, he's pretty good at that. And so after a lot of arguing back and forth with God, which I just want to say this, you never win an argument with God. When I was young and I would try to argue with my mother, she would always say this, I brought you into this world. <laughs> That's the end of the discussion. She would say, I gave you life. I'd say, yeah, but, 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 but anything else you add after that just pales in comparison. How are you going to argue with God? Moses starts making his way to Egypt. He goes to Egypt, goes before the Pharaoh's court, and uh, he says, let my people go. You want me to turn loose of three to five million slaves, free labor? Have you lost your, your marbles? And Moses says... But what's this? And he takes his staff and throws it down and it becomes a snake. And Moses kind of says, hey, that's pretty good. That's good right there. <laughs> Don't mess with Moses. And Pharaoh sort of nods over there to his court musicians. Those are the guys with the bathrobes and the tall pointy hats with sun and stars on them. And they all got a staff too. And they all throw their staff down. They all become snakes. 
And Pharaoh looks up at Moses like, is that all you got? Kind of got a smirk on his face. I can just see it being played out in the court. And Moses is like, God didn't tell me about this in the burning bush. I thought I had something exclusive here. And while they're trying to figure out what to do, the magicians are holding their hands over their mouth. They're gasping because on the floor, Moses' snake is eating up all the other snakes. Hmm. He gets done consuming all the other snakes. Moses reaches back down there and picks up his staff, picks it up. It's a little fatter now. And all the magicians are going. This is more than just the God of Israel. It is bigger than the God of Pharaoh's court, which was divination. The devil can only duplicate what God does to a point. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But when God wins... He wins more than just the battle. When God gets done, the devil's got one less trick in his bag. Because when that showdown was over in Pharaoh's court, the magicians didn't have their staff anymore. It was all up inside of Moses' staff. God removed the evidence that there was ever a challenge to his power and his greatness. I don't know what the devil's got going on in your world, but when God is done, there's not even going to be evidence that God had an opponent. Now, what does the Bible say about this? The Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God not only wins, he eats up all the evidence that there was an opponent. Now, when the Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, this means more than just there's going to be victory in the battle. This means that the weapon, the instrument, the thing that was used to try to harm God's people, is going to be annihilated. The weapon shall not prosper. He's referring to the weapon itself. When God defeats the enemy, the enemy does more than lose the battle. The enemy loses the weapon. I mean, Satan had been forming that weapon for the sole purpose to bring you down. It was custom made. It was a weapon just to tear you down. It could have been a thought. It could have been a fear. It could have been an attitude. It could have been a hatred. But the devil had been forming that weapon. But ladies and gentlemen, when you give it all to Jesus at an altar of repentance, you do more than just win the battle. You remove that weapon out of the devil's hands so that there's not even any evidence. So when the enemy comes attacking you, you need to say, look here, big boy. Not only are you going to be defeated, but you're going to lose your weapons. I mean, it's as if you're on the Lord's team, and not only do you win the game, but the other team has disappeared. They were run out of the stadium. There's no evidence that you even had an opponent. You don't have any bruises. You don't have a dirty uniform. There's no grass stains. There's no evidence that there was even a battle. The field's not even messed up. It's dry ground. I, I, I thought they were having a contest here. I thought there was a, 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 a big competition. No. Nope. Not when God's involved. Not only does the sea divide, we got dry ground to walk on. Not only did we win the victory, but the enemy is not even on the premises. When they threw the three Hebrew children in the fire, King of Babylon made sure that these boys were going to be made an example of because they wouldn't bow down to his golden figure of himself. 
King Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody bow down. We play the music. Everybody bow down except these three Hebrew children that had been taught since they were a child that they weren't to bow to any except the only one true living God. So he said, fine. Heat the fire hotter. Seven times hotter than it had ever been heated before. I mean, we're going to make an example out of that. The king did not realize something that the enemy still has not learned, and that is simply this. When you throw everything you have at God's children, all you're doing is playing into the hands of God that is going to use that trial for even a bigger miracle. Yeah. The Bible says that it was so hot that the people that threw them into the fire, the soldiers, the bouncers, whatever they were, the bailiffs, the best, the elite, the Navy SEALs, the court, the, the king's personal bodyguards. The ones that were the technicians of torture. When they went to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, the Bible says that the men that tried to throw them in were consumed with fire. Now, I always read that and thought, well, that's, you know, the Bible telling you how hot the fire is. But now I realize it's more than that. It wasn't by accident that the instruments that were being used against God's people were no more. The thing that was going to be used to put them in the heat evaporated, disappeared, burned up. God took them out of the picture. When all this is said and done, it's going to be more than just, I survived a really hot fire. No, no, there's going to be a residue of the miraculous. This is going to be more than just, I survived a really, really big trial. This is going to be bigger than just a personal victory. God is going to use my fiery trial to eliminate the forces of evil. This is kingdom building stuff. This is stuff that makes the enemy think twice before he attacks another child of God. Because you think about this. Just think about this for a moment. Think about it. The next time they get ready to throw some folks in the burning fiery furnace there in Nebuchadnezzar's court, all the palace guards are calling in sick. I just, I don't, I don't feel like I can go to work today. I got a headache. I'm not feeling good. I, I, I don't think I can make it. Where's all my palace guards? They heard what happened last time you threw in some of them Hebrew children. And they don't want to have nothing to do with it. Why you think Pilate was washing his hands? Why you think Pilate's wife was saying, don't have nothing to do with this, Jesus? I had a dream last night. There is something that resonates through the courts of hell that says those are God's people and there's going to be consequences for messing with them. You ought to be able to live your life not in fear of failure, but you ought to lift up your head and set your voice like a trumpet and say, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. I am a child of God and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Oh, come on, clap your hands under the Lord. There's a residue of the miraculous that's on God's people. God is just going to Take care of things. Wipe them up like gravy. Going to leave a residue of peace in this place. You may say, I used to fight a bunch of uncertainties and battles in my own mind about whether or not God loved me, but, but when the smoke clears, I'm going to come out of this fiery trial convinced that God's on my side. I'm not even going to doubt it. Throw everything you got at me, devil. It's just going to make my testimony greater. Come on now, you got to get some backbone. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Bible said the three Hebrew children came out of the fire and even their, the hair on their arms was not burned. The Bible says their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's the residue of the miraculous. There's not even any evidence that I was in a trial. There's no evidence that I was even in a burning fiery furnace. They don't even have a tan. I mean, their cheeks are not even flush. They, they, they don't even look stressed. Devil 
throwing everything at you but the kitchen sink. You coming up in here in this house today singing and bebopping. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too blessed to be depressed. It got good to give me so many blessings. It don't even look like you're in a fight. You've been going through hell and high water all week long, but you got up in the house of God. I am his child. He is a faithful friend. I can do all things through Christ. That frustrates the devil. You want to ruin the devil's day? You want to praise God like you never have before? You want to celebrate like you never have before? I mean, you don't even look like you're in a fight. You look good. You look happy. You have a glow about you. That's the residue of the miraculous. It's the joy of the Lord. I'm under the shadow of the Almighty. And you may be having all kinds of problems. You may be having stuff going on in your home with your spouse, kids, job, neighbors. Who knows? But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, I'm in the residue of the miraculous. Somebody said, hey, I know you. Didn't you used to be a drunk? Yep. But now I'm drunk on the Holy Ghost. Woo! Hey, I know you. You used to run around in the bars of Palm Bay and Melbourne. I know you. Didn't you used to be a player? Yep, but now I'm playing my 10 finger instrument. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. You say, come on, there ought to be something left over from your past life. There's nothing left over. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have become new. I've got the residue of the miraculous. Stand to your feet. Everything else in life will tell you. Doesn't matter if you go to Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. They'll tell you you're going to battle this the rest of your life. That's the residue of sin. But let me tell you about the residue of the miraculous. And be not conformed to this world. Romans 12 says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He changed us from the ground up. I don't walk the way I used to walk. I don't talk the way I used to. I don't think the way I used to think. Prophets of Baal made the mistake of taking the challenge of the prophet Elijah on the top of Mount Carmel. Whichever God can answer by fire was the challenge. That'll be the true God of Israel. And the prophets of Baal had the first shot and they tried through the heat of the day. They couldn't get their God to even give them a spark. Nothing. They cried, they hollered, they chanted, they cut themselves. But it fell on deaf ears. Elijah waits until they have all given up, and then he sets up an altar, puts the sacrifice on it, pours water all over it, so much water that it fills a trench that they have dug around the altar. Elijah just prays a simple prayer, and the fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice, but it doesn't stop there. It consumes the stones and the water. And then the Bible said it licked up the dust before it recedes back into heaven. People all stand there stunned and then they fall on their faces while the prophets of Baal take off running for their lives. What follows is a revival that turns the heart of Israel back to the one true living God. What is forgotten in the story is that the Lord did not even leave any evidence of a challenge, no evidence of a competition, dry ground a bare spot in the earth no markers no natural reminders nothing left but the residue of the miraculous all we have left is an empty tomb we have Jesus we have no blood we have no evidence of a struggle on Calvary or even in Gethsemane as far as that goes just dry ground ladies and gentlemen you have fought some battles. You've had some lonely nights. You've had some tears that have been shed in private. 
But when John got a glimpse into heaven, he recorded in the book of Revelation, there was no more tears. There was no more night. All I see when I look into heaven is saints that are throwing their crowns before the king and saying, holy, holy, holy. Where's the evidence that they are fallen creatures that are born in sin and shaped in iniquity? There's no evidence in heaven. All that's in heaven are worshipers, praisers, people that are lifting their hearts and their heads and their voices in exaltation unto the one who sits on the throne. How can they do that? They were born under the sin and the sting of Adam and Eve. But they've been washed in the blood. That's the residue of the Almighty. Ladies and gentlemen, He can turn your mourning into dancing. Not just remove your mourning, but turn your sorrow into joy. Turn your mourning into dancing. Turn wetland into dry land. Change its DNA structure. Where I used to be sad, now I'm happy. Where I used to be despondent, now I'm rejoicing. Why don't you let God work in your life today? Why don't you let him take away the scars? Because he can do more than just win the battle. He can remove the evidence of a struggle. I don't know about you, but I think we need a God that can do more than just deliver us from sin. I need a God that can deliver me from the remembrance of sin. That's the residue of the Almighty. Who else but Jesus can bring you over on dry ground? Who else but Jesus can not only deliver your body, but deliver your mind? Who else but Jesus can not only heal your sickness, but heal your emotions? Anybody in this house today can raise your hand and say, I need a God that can leave the residue of the miraculous so that whenever this service is over and I go to my house, I still go in the glory of a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's going to be with me in my car. He's going to be with me in my house. He's going to be with me on the street and on my job. I walk in His presence. All right, every head is bowed right now and every eye is closed. I'd like to give you an invitation to come to this altar. Maybe you've been struggling with some chains. Maybe they've been emotional chains, mental chains, physical chains, financial chains, social chains, whatever the chains are. Breaking the chains is more than just a slogan. Breaking the chains is more than just a song. Breaking the chains is an explanation of the God that we serve. Because I've come to tell you this morning that not only can he break the chain, he can remove the chain. So there's not even anything left. There's no rubbish that's left over where there was once an encounter. There was not even that evidence left on the battlefield. There is nothing but victory and joy. Come on. You ought to come. Thank you for coming. You ought to come out of your seat right now to this altar. And you ought to lift up your hands and your voices right now. Because I feel the residue of a miraculous God. Hallelujah. Who is sending his peace and his love and his joy this very day. Oh, that's it. You ought to lift up your hands right now in your voice. And say, God, I receive you into my life. I hope that you have enjoyed today's message and the preaching of the Word of God. I'd like to invite you to join us on our website at www.fpcpalmbay.com. Many resources are available for you as well as a live streaming of our services here at First Pentecostal Church. Also, you can call our front office at 321-723-2030. And there we will join you in prayer for a special need that you may have. Also, you're more than welcome to be a part of a live service right here at First Pentecostal Church in Palm Bay, Florida. Now, God bless you as you continue in your journey with God until we meet again. Come on, put those hands together.